is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio on the Overseas Radio Network, and I'm here with Mike Gar, the CFO of Capital Conservator Group, our uh, economics, financial, and general cultural and political kibitzer. And he told me a great story that I didn't know over the during the uh, break that I want him, him to repeat. It was the uh, acceptance speech of Gary Johnson for well, the actually it was it, the, okay. as he is accepting the nom- uh, putting his name in denomination and asking for the votes for the libertarians at the convention a month ago. The Libertarian Party already had his convention a month ago. And uh, <clears throat> basically he ended his speech relating a story where he was doing an interview where the interviewer asked him, look, you're, you're, you're tied down to the rack with electrical wires uh, uh, hooked up to you, and you have to choose. Are you going to vote for Barack Obama or Mitt Romney? And he said with a very straight face, I'm telling you seriously that I have climbed Mount Everest. I am a man who knows what he wants, and I'm telling you, surely enough, I would die before I would vote for either one of those two. So, uh, and uh, of course, libertarians erupted in applause because so would I. Well, you know, I can honestly say I have only ever voted for a major party candidate twice in my life, 1980 and 1984. All the time before that, and since, I've always voted for whatever right-wing nut party most appealed to me um, because it was sending a message. You have you have to send them a message. And people say, well, gee, it's it's so important to get a Republican elected. No, it's important to get good people elected. I thought you voted for Teddy Roosevelt. I wasn't quite <laughs> old enough to vote for Teddy Roosevelt. Thank you. I walked a precinct for Barry Goldwater when I was 11. I was not alive when Teddy Roosevelt. I get, I get confused. Yeah, I know. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Okay, Obama. Mr. Obama has had a week with bad news, and uh, of course, about the economy, and his return to his usual tactic, which is to blame Congress and others for the struggling economy. He says, Congress should stop dithering and pass the American Jobs Act to put more than one million people back to work. He wants to take a whole bunch of US, of government money and throw it into so-called in, infrastructural projects, which basically means hire people to work for the government, right? Right. Well, that's a way of putting money into the economy is you hire people, you get them jobs, what uh, FDR put people back to work, right? Uh, spend a bunch of money on these public works projects, uh, which gives the government employees money. And then there's a service industry that pops up around those people as the money cycles through the economy. The problem is, of course, now if the tax, is, uh, tax rates higher, the money doesn't cycle as much as it used to. Right? It gets pulled out. That's very Keynesian. Um, the, the higher the tax rate, the, the, the less cycles you get of the money. Well, it didn't work for FDR. In fact, the United States didn't come out of the really uh, uh, its economy come back until after the Second World War. Exactly. It's true. It didn't. Uh, well, you know, here, here's, a, here's a major flaw in, in this stimulus package and, and in what Spain's done. And, uh, and there was a great TED Talk. I don't know if you've ever been on uh, YouTube and seen the TED Talks. Uh, it's a technology conference, whatever, and they always have somebody who gives give the speech of your life, and it's like 10 or 15 minutes long, and there's a, a great TED Talk. The guy's kind of socialist, but I, it, the point is made, though, which is he's talking about putting a million people back to work, creating a million jobs. Obviously, there's not a million jobs in this package, but he's talking about it cycling and creating these other jobs, but the Democrats have this fundamental misunderstanding that the government somehow supplies jobs, which it doesn't. The Republicans have a fundamental misunderstanding of, of, of how jobs are created. They think rich people create jobs, and that's not true either. Rich people and corporations don't create jobs. They provide jobs when they're needed. What creates jobs is demand. What creates jobs is my long grass because I need somebody to cut it. That's creating a job. What creates jobs is normal people who need stuff. If there's a demand for something, that creates a job. Corporations, companies, the last thing they want to do is hire somebody else because employees are an expense. They come off the bottom line. And you only hire somebody to do a job when you cannot meet the demand with your existing uh, employees and personnel. So you create a job is the last resort. We are so busy, we need to hire somebody else, right? So the, the jobs come from the demands 
from the economy. And how do you create that? Well, if you, if you understand now that the jobs don't come from big corporations, what you need is a functioning free enterprise society. Because you have, if you have small to medium businesses, which create more jobs per dollar, always have always, and that's been, that was the success of the United States for so many years. Is we had more small and medium sized employers than any other country in the world ever had, and it was a great, great experiment. Well, because we to get away the middle it. class, as I've said many times, is always the source from which freedom comes. The poor just want to get to their next meal, right? and the rich can buy what they want, regardless of the government. Right. It's the middle class that creates and demands freedom. It, and, and demands, it demands uh, goods and services. Yeah. Right? And the middle class is demanding goods and services. Let's just say the middle class, uh, they want refrigerators, right? They want better refrigerators. Well, there's companies that provide refrigerators, and now they need more jobs. So where do they go get people to fill those jobs? Well, they go to the middle class. But if the if the unemployment level is so low, now those manufacturers say, well, I guess we'll have to pour, pull from the poor people. We need people, anybody, even if they don't have experience. So, And that's how everybody gets raised up together. And it's because of the demand that's created with the dynamic, dynamic economy. But the opportunity to society is limited because if you were to invent a new type of refrigerator that was much more energy efficient, much cheaper to build and everything else, they would regulate it to make it impossible for you to produce it. And that's, that's the problems we're running up against now is overregulation, too much socialism, the government is too involved and too restrictive. And the barrier for entry into the business, I mean, look at the medallion stuff. John Stossel did a great thing about taxi cabs. Taxis are so simple in theory. I have a car, you need to get from point A to point B, I will drive you. How much do I need? I need I need a driver's license, right? That should I need a driver's license and a car. Any idiot could could do this. But no, no, in New York, Washington DC, every major city in the United States except for one uh, and I, I forget which was, maybe it was Baltimore, I don't remember. Uh, they have medallions where you can only be an official taxi cab if you have this medallion. How much does it cost to get a medallion? A million dollars. Well, even in Uruguay, okay, poor country, Yes. one of the people we both know, his father owns some taxis, and in Uruguay now, to get a parking space for his taxi, in front of the Conrad Hotel, he had to pay seventy thousand dollars every year, or just he had it forever once he got it. I think I think he, I think he had it forever, but it's still a hell of a lot of money in Uruguay. Right, a high barrier to entry, and that reduces competition, which keeps the prices high for everybody, which keeps the society from becoming wealthy. Sure. Well, somebody sent me a quote from John Maynard Keynes, who said he was in favor of hiring people to dig ditches and then fill them back in again just right, to give them jobs. Right, because that just puts money into the economy. And that's, that's what Helicopter Ben Bernanke, that's why his name is Helicopter Ben, right? He could solve the Great Depression, the Keynesian crisis that it was, by just dumping money into the economy. Of course, all that ends up doing is shoring up the banks and per perhaps risking hyperinflation. Well, if they would just... I mean, if the big companies would pay back the corporate welfare that they've gotten, that would go a hell of a long way toward balancing the budget. Well, I, you know, perhaps, but maybe not, because those companies would then go under. I mean, if, you, if Tony Robbins had a, a video out where he basically talks about the deficit and the debt and how much is owed, and you could you could tax all the Fortune 500 companies 100 percent, and you would take care of it for this year. Sure, but I, well, like the banks, though. I mean, they, they spent they gave away more. They gave away more to the big banks and foreign central banks than the entire national debt. Yeah. Okay. One, one, of, the, one of the first recipients uh, from the TARP funds was Commerce. Okay. Yeah, it's just, and you know, this idea of being too big to fail just offends me because, you know, the guy with the hot, do the hot dog vendor on the street, that's his livelihood. And when you say some other company's too big to fail, that means he isn't worth a damn. Where is equality of the law? Anyway. For now, we're back. Again, we've run out of time at this segment, so we have to break for a word from our sponsors. This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio. We'll be right back.
This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio on the Overseas Radio Network. And I'm here with Capital Conservators CFO Mike Gard talking about all kinds of things, most of them sort of economic, but we sort of wander around. Congratulations We're, to Rafa Nadal for his victory in the French Open today. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Is that, so, uh, that good? That's the first sports thing that has ever been on the show. Well, you know, he, he beat Djokovic right in the final, and he's Serbian, so it's, it's appropriate. Yeah, that's you appropriate. Know, so that's that's I mean, people here are very sad. Yeah. Djokovic won the last three. And the other guy was from what country? Uh, Spain. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway. Um, okay, in political circles... The Congressional Budget Office is traditionally considered an honest broker, an objective referee that simply presents the facts without taking a position on the numbers. Now, if you believe that, then again, we're back to the Easter Bunny. But uh, they're less crooked than some of the others, I think. Well, it's CBO, and then there's the OMB, right? And they've always fought each other. Yeah, the Office of Management of the Budget is the president's Executive, number diddlers. Right. And, and what's really good is when the Congress is, is controlled by one party and the executive branch by another party, and the CBO and the OMB numbers are vastly different. Right. Almost every time. And we're back to that famous quote, I forget from whom, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Was it that Churchill? No, actually, it wasn't. I think it was... Uh, I think it's George Santana. I don't know. Yes. Anyway, um, they've recently released an infographic showing America's GDP debt ratio over the last hundred years through World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the Nixon gold shock, and the global financial crisis. And it's pretty amazing to put in context how much debt levels have risen since the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913 and when Richard Nixon ended the dollar to gold convertibility in 1973. Now, they have scenarios for growth. They have two of them for the future, both of which come under the heading of something you would put in a manure spreader, I think. I was uh, thinking of some sort of science fiction novel. Okay. Neither one of them has well, any basis in reality. Yeah. Okay, well, I spent six years on a farm, so manure spreader seems to <laughs> seems to be appropriate. What do you think, Mike, about... Their numbers are, are complete fantasy, uh, but... And, and, and I don't know why. So they obviously legalized doing drugs in the CBO, at least. <laughs> Medical marijuana in yeah. the CBO. They're well, all high. They, they need it for medicinal purposes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just maybe to get through the day there because they can see the handwriting on the wall and it's so bad. But in both cases, um, it's nuts. I mean, the baseline case, right, it, it, they're, they're assuming that even without spending any more money, that the economy is going to continue to grow and that somehow spending is going to fall, right? Uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. However, in their other scenario, they assume that current spending policies remain in place uh, and the debt skyrockets to Japan levels. Um, it's something would happen before, and it can't skyrocket to Japan levels because uh, the U.S. dollar, being the reserve currency of the world, can't get to that point without the entire world economy collapsing first. So um, it's it's a complete uh, fantasy. The whole thing is make believe. Well, the bottom line is there is hardly any real money in the world. No, I, it was a great thing I saw on Facebook or something. Maybe Imgur. Uh, it was a picture, and it had a picture of the U.S. dollar and a monopoly dollar. And it said, what's the difference in these two things? You believe one of them is worth more than the other. That's it. They're both paper. They have no intrinsic value at all. Well, I, I got some more information on, on the Argentinian pesos. Now they're doing them in different colors. And so they resemble the monopoly. Yeah, certain <laughs> colors you can buy property with, and certain colors you can do other you gotta things you got to be kidding with. me. No, so, no. So some of the money is actually good for property. Right. And some of it's good for, for what, food? Um, let me see. I, 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 I got this in from one of our, one of our listeners. Uh, it, light blue is only for real estate, to buy and rent homes. Uh, and they're different ones. They're parallel, parallel bills. This doesn't even make any sense. I mean, the whole idea of having a currency is for an exchange, a medium of exchange, right? A store of value and a medium of exchange. So that, you know, if I want to buy beans and you want to buy a car, I mean, how many beans is a car worth? Well, you use the money to figure that out. I mean, otherwise, you go back to barter. Right? And, right. and if you start breaking up the dollars into different currencies, you're going to start bartering. Well, remember, they, they tried bartering, and the IRS came down on it so hard that they just uh, the IRS decided to impute values and profits to the barter. In Argentina? No, in the United States. 
in the United States. They, they, they tried it in the United now, States. The IRS is, is, is ballsy enough to go into Argentina, though, and try to tell them how to Well, they're it. probably the ones advising them on their tax policy. <laughs> well, that well, well, that, their... No, that's not, that, that, that's not probable. That's true, in fact. The, the Infernal Revenue Service has set up a separate division. They did this a couple of years ago, which is why I haven't talked about it on the radio show, but I just thought of it. And they have sent experts to all of the major South American countries to show them how to properly value things and collect taxes, which is why the South American economies are doing so well. I mean, yeah, it totally makes sense. I now. mean, this is almost as good as Columbus bringing the diseases that wiped out the Indians. Well, you know, I remember seeing this study uh, several years back where they did uh, an analysis of tax returns that had errors made. Errors made of a significant nature, which means you, that the amount paid or calculated that needed to be paid was more than 5% off, right, right. the actual number. Over half, it was like 52% of those mistakes had been made by IRS employees, not not the the citizen filling out the form, but the IRS employees uh, filling out the forms for them. The whole point being here that the IRS professionals who have been presumably trained uh, on how to fill out these forms, make more mistakes than the untrained layman at home. And if they make a mistake and fill out your help, it, when still you fill your out your fault. tax return, it's still your fault. Yes. You still have to pay penalties, penalties, interest, uh, interest etc. So sure. this is a great setup. Yeah. And so now they, they're teaching South America how to do it. It all makes sense now. And this is a country that was founded on a penny a pound tax on tea. Right, because that was egregious. I mean, America. Draconian taxes. America was founded by tax protesters. Think about it. Yeah. You know, America was founded completely by tax protesters. They were founded by ta they talked about taxation without representation, etc. And the the uh, the unilateral actions of the British Crown against the colonies, etc. Telling the local courts where to sit, telling the local governments what to do. Gee, that sounds like the United States Justice Department and the IRS. Well, wasn't, I mean, is, isn't the phrase, give them an inch, then they'll take a yard? Wasn't that uh, talking about the government's intrusions? Because I think so. An inch, they take a yard. And uh, they knew that the penny per pound on the tee was an inch, but it was an inch they weren't willing to give. It's a slippery slope. Uh, and sure enough, I mean, if you look at what's happened, and with all the the warnings our founding fathers in the United States gave us, look at how we have descended into uh, uh, almost we're, we're borderline totalitarian dictatorship. I mean, I say borderline. Obama has claimed the right to kill citizens. And here's something I don't understand. I mean, I don't know if you've spoken about this uh, on on the show on another day, David. I haven't heard you talk about it. And you've talked about the NDAA quite a bit, but if there. And even uh, Lindsey Graham was talking about the battlefield. What battlefield? Okay, a battlefield by definition is the field where a battle takes place in a war. We haven't been at war since World War II because a war requires a prerequisite for war would be a declaration thereof by the U.S. Congress. We haven't had a declaration of war. What I'm telling you is we have no battlefield right now. So. So for them to say, we, you know, that's the battlefield, that the U.S. is the battlefield, the world is the battlefield, we have no battlefield. Until you can get Congress to declare a battlefield, there isn't one. So there should be no assassinations going on. There should be no battlefield promotions going on. There's no battlefield. Right. And what's also said, you cannot, you, you cannot suspend habeas corpus when the courts are sitting, you know, et cetera. I right. mean, there's all these restrictions that are in the Bill of Rights that I've been talking about that are, are being completely ignored. But the most egregious is that they ha the thing that made America strong and made it a world power was its economy. It was an economic powerhouse, and that has been destroyed. Right. And that, that is where the power comes from. It's like, you know, the Constitution is great. Um, that, is, uh, that defines our rights that were given to us by God, right? The Constitution is fantastic. But uh, it, it's backed up by the guns. And like you, yeah, I think you said in the last hour, we, we're turning from a rule of law into a rule of men. And that's scary. Well, we've turned. Because, you know, yes, because men men suck, right? I mean, all, all the great atrocities in the world have been created, done by men, right? You know, Hitler, Stalin, Mao. I mean, all these people, Pol Pot, it's, it's these men 
who, who in, in is a, a culture of personality that these these countries once they once they start to follow a man a man instead of following the law. Well, everything well, Martin Luther King his my favorite quote he said everything Hitler did was legal. Yes, exactly. You know, because it, I, it, there's a Nixon uh, Frost movie where he says at one point in the movie, Nixon says, if the president does it, it can't be illegal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, only because I suppose the president can pardon himself. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, th there are there are a few exceptions. Uh, quickly, we're, we're down to our last like minute or so. Uh, Liechtenstein is now giving up. Sort of. Uh, Liechtenstein, uh, Liechtensteinista Landesbank, LLB, uh, has, is sent letters to 36,000, no, to, has told its American clients uh, that anybody who had an account of $500,000 or more at any time since the beginning of 2004 are going to be covered by an information request sent from the United States. And is, but at least it's being more fair than some other countries. It's giving them a chance to contest it, et cetera, in the Liechtenstein courts. So that was a fishing expedition by the IRS. Correct. correct. It's a fishing we, expedition. We want to know everybody who has an account of over $500,000. Right. Correct. Right. Exactly. And they're also saying they're going to go, the U.S. is saying they're going to go after Singapore, Dubai, Hong Kong, et cetera. Now, I personally believe that. Uh, Singapore, Dubai, and Hong Kong are going to tell them to go to hell. Or, as you pointed out earlier in the day, Mike, said, uh-uh. So, I think they'll say, yeah, we'll do it, but then yeah. they won't. Right. Anyway, we're, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. It like, all comes down to the bottom line is expatriate your assets, then expatriate your ass. Because you only have three choices left. Give up and live as a slave, fight back, or get out. This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio.